There is a, a, an old favorite stewardship book that begins with a story. The story is of the Christian missionaries going to the, to the area set, uh, occupied by the Goths, one of the tribes of, of Europe um, during the Roman, uh, late stage Roman Empire. And the missionaries would go and they would preach, and, and the Goth tribes mostly converted to Christianity. Um, but the rumor was that when they would be baptized, the Goth warriors would go into the waters, but they would leave their sword hands above the waters so that they could then say, I am baptized, but my sword arm is not. Uh, thus, thus they could live their Christian ethics um, in their body as if that somehow some part of their life was left unbaptized. The book goes on to say that I think modern Christians do that with their wallets. They leave their wallets up above the baptismal waters and say, I'm baptized, but my wallet is not. Um, I've always thought that was a funny story. And it's the type of story we might think about when Jesus says things like, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, but when I want to think about stewardship, when I want to think about what Jesus means by that, it is about far more than our wallets. Um, as funny as that may be, Jesus is someone who is talking about how does our life preach? our values are the things that people would look at our lives and assess as our treasure, our most precious values, the ones we claim here on Sundays to have. While I was on uh, vacation, one of the things I like to do after everyone else falls asleep is watch terrible movies. Um, uh, movies I know that Caroline will be mad and say, oh, you watched that. Um, some of the times they're good movies, they're just not Caroline movies. Um, and I rewatched probably for the fifth or sixth time recently, uh, uh, The Book of Eli. Now some of you hear the things that I talk about and take those as recommendations. So I want to warn you, it is a violent post-apocalyptic thriller. So if you're not into that kind of thing, don't go watch it because Andrew said so. Um, but it has, throughout it, a theological line. Eli's character has been called in this post-apocalyptic world to take what is believed to be the last remaining Bible into a secure place. And he feels a sense of personal calling from God that this is his life's goal. Um, and along the way, he comes to have a, a young companion who, doesn't, who wasn't alive before the world fell. And she says, what was it like? And, and this is kind of a tuning fork line for me. He says, we had so many things, we forgot what was precious and what wasn't. And then as a big sci-fi fantasy nerd, I can't help but hear Gollum's voice saying, my precious, my precious about the allure of the one ring in his life. There are many things that are precious to us, our treasure, where our heart lies. But I wonder with Eli if we, too, get mistaken about what is really precious to us. Are we living our lives according to our stated values? Or do we have stated values and then allow our life in its hubbub and its crazy number of voices clamoring for our attention to dictate to us that we live and spend energy with other things being demonstrably precious to us than what we might choose to value? The, the writer of Hebrews speaks of, and this is one of the sections of Hebrews 11 and 12 that we, we read regu more regularly than the rest of Hebrews, is looking at these leaders in faith, Abraham, Moses, the, the folks who went on these journeys. They left something behind to think about a homeland in the future and says they could have always gone back 
right? We remember the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. What is it that they say to Moses? Can we go back to be slaves in Egypt? It was so wonderful there. We had food to eat. We didn't have to ask questions about values. We did what our life was prescribed and provided for us. You had brought us out into the wilderness to die in misery. Let's just go back. There's always an allure to going back. And the writer of Hebrews knows that. He understands the gravity of that which we don't want to be precious, but it becomes so all the same. When Tolkien writes the Lord of the Kings, he's writing from his deeply Roman Catholic background. And the one ring becomes demonstrative of wealth and power. And everybody, our one figure alone, is, is caught up in the allure of it. Gandalf won't touch it because he knows that he will succumb to its power, the seductive power that it provides. Even the hobbits over time come to a, to a point where it begins to become so precious to them they would sacrifice everything else. There's, uh, interestingly, a character that doesn't make it into the movies called Tom Bombadil who is the only person the ring has no allure of. He's a strange enough character and a side enough plot of the books that most of the movie writers thought the movie would get too long, right? Peter Jackson took three, three-hour movies to tell it, and that guy was going to make it too long. Um, uh, but I, there's a really great thing written about him. It says he was, in many ways, meant to be the second Adam Jesus figure of Tolkien's book. He has no interest in dominating other people. Thus, the ring has no power to dominate him. And I think about that, and I think about who Jesus was. Jesus being able to stand before Pilate and say, you have no power over me. Even though the rest of Jesus' narrative would be dictated by Pilate's choices, at least the next three days worth of his narrative would be dictated by Pilate's choices. Jesus, who has no power or desire to dominate us, has no ability to have his narrative dominated by somebody else. And he draws us into this conversation, I think, to think about what is controlling our life? What is precious? And what are we, a la St. Francis of Assisi, who tells us to preach the gospel of all times, but if necessary, use words? What are our life choices preaching? What gospel are we telling by the choices we make about what really is precious to us? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's one of those kind of questions that keeps me up at night. I don't know about you, where, where I watch it. I mean, let me think. Uh, we were never going to get DVD players for our kids, which is why we have four of them when we travel. Um, you know, I was going to be that parent that never allowed my kids to become some, so overprogrammed. Yeah, that went about as well as the DVD players. You know, life has a seductive capacity to it that requires us to, to, to get uh, a space, a space like this, a community like this, a peer pressure like you walking together in the life of faith to say, what is precious to me? And am I living my energy and my time according to that preciousness? And so, the, the he, whether we're in Hebrews and we're looking at Abraham and Moses, whether we're looking at James and John and Peter and Andrew who are told to drop their nets and reorient their life in a new way, whether it's about these new Christian communities trying to hold off from the seductive power of Rome to create a different kind of community, or whether it's us today saying, are we living our lives with the knowledge of what is precious and what isn't. When we're so seductively invited to get lost in the thousands of voices clamoring for our attention. 
They say, uh, I think you see something like a thousand advertisements a day. A thousand people are clamoring for your attention today to tell you what should be precious to you. Jesus looks at us and says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Where are you living the gospel for the world to see? This is the word of our Lord.